because I believe that everything should be injected every day for stable levels, there really is no difference between using NPP or DECA. Warning! You're watching Dr. Todd Lee TV, where theoretically you could learn a bunch of cool shit. Greetings, Earthlings. Like, subscribe, and share this video. Share with a friend. Share with enemies. Share with people who think they know everything. Spread it like herpes. Also, speaking of herpes, I am a medical doctor and I could be your doctor. That only requires you to click the link in the description box. I can order you blood work, I can read the blood work, I can treat any illnesses. I basically, it's like an HRT clinic that's a one-man army. Also, I do coaching. Dr. Karina Dotson and I have a coaching business called Apex Coaching. So if you sign up with me, you get coaching, which is nutrition, programming, competition prep, or lifestyle coaching, as well as all the medical stuff. So you have three people, two doctors, and one business. Greetings, Earthlings. It is I, Dr. Todd Lee. I am a biochemist, medical doctor, and an IFBB professional bodybuilder. And based off of these things, I think I have a unique set of skills that makes me apt to discuss today's topic, which is everything you need to know about nandrolone, aka DECA. So first and foremost, let's talk structure. Nandrolone is a nortestosterone, a 19 nortestosterone. There's a methyl group missing from carbon 19, otherwise it's basically testosterone. That nandrolone has a lot of different preparations. It's often referred to as DECA. That's because there is a 10 carbon chain attached to position 17. That's called the ester. It's a 10 carbon ester, so it has a relatively long half-life. There's also NPP, phenylpropionate, nandrolone propionate. There's a whole bunch of different esters attached to nandrolone. You'll be hard pressed to find anything other than nandrolone decanoate or phenylpropionate. For this reason, people just refer to NPP and DECA, that one's a short acting, one's a long acting, that unlike other short esters, the molecular weight of the phenylpropionate ester is pretty much the same as the molecular weight of the decanoate ester. And so you still only get 63%. So a lot of people say you get more trend with trenacetate than trenanathate. You get more test with test propionate than um, test amanthate. That's true, but it's kind of insignificant because you titrate it to the dosage effect you're looking for. I will use these two drugs interchangeably. Just know that because I believe that everything should be injected every day for stable levels, there really is no difference between using NPP or DECA. I traditionally always choose the longest acting drug because I want to have it build up in the system to its highest level. Now, although it is capable of being aromatized and converting over to estrogen, estradiol or esterone, it doesn't typically do that very much. It does at about 20% the rate of testosterone. However, it does seem to cause gyno more than one would attribute normally to an equal amount, let alone less amount of estrogen. And the reason is, is because it is very weakly binding to the progesterone receptor. When something weakly binds to the receptor, sometimes it has the antagonistic effect. So the progesterone receptor, when agonized or activated, reduces the estrogen receptor alpha. In this case, because we're antagonizing the progesterone receptor, we're upregulating the estrogen receptor. Now, a lot of people are probably confused. Simply put, nandrolone being added to a cycle that has testosterone will amplify the gyno relative to that amount of estrogen in the system. So let's say you know for sure you're stable on a 50 estrogen. You run 40 milligrams of test a day. That's 280 a week. And you have what is approximately a 50 E2 or estradiol and you have no gyno. You add in maybe 20 milligrams a day of nandrolone, and that should be more benign than 60 a day of test. But for some reason, even though your estradiol doesn't go up, you have gyno. And the reason is because there's more estrogen receptor alpha on the breast tissue because of the nandrolone. So since there's more estrogen receptor alpha on the breast tissue, the 
50 estradiol you have is now acting as if it was 100 or 150. And the way that it does this is that it's antagonizing the progesterone receptor and the progesterone receptor is there to keep in check estrogenic activity. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking this is too complicated. I don't understand. Bottom line is you never mix test and DECA. That's it. That's the easiest way to understand this drug is that if you're going to use testosterone, do not use DECA. And I, I remember when I say DECA, I mean all nandrolones. Do not use nandrolone and testosterone together. Don't do it. People are like, but I thought, and so-and-so says, and blah, blah, blah. Don't do it. It's just not worth it. But I want the joint benefits, or I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that. Just don't do it. Now, nandrolone by itself is great except it doesn't convert to estradiol. And as we've explained countless times, you need the estradiol to activate the GH to make IGF. Despite what anyone else says, they're wrong. You do need it. That I had a 173 IGF-1 when I ran nandrolone only because I only had a six estradiol. And when I run 100 estradiol by means of testosterone, I can get my IGF-1 up to 568. So why would you want to run nandrolone? Well, nandrolone has some extra side effects that are perceived as strengths. One is people think that it's good for your joints. The reason why people think it's good for the, your joints is that your joints may hurt less when you add nandrolone to a cycle. So let's say your joints hurt. You're like, I'm going to run some DECA because some people say DECA is good for your joints and your joints stop hurting. The reason why is that it is antagonistic to the glucocorticoid binding to the cortisol receptor. Also, there's a cortical binding protein, CBG. So it binds strongly to CBG and it bumps off cortisol into the bloodstream. So there is a very short-term benefit in the sense that there's more free circulating cortisol present when you add nandrolone to a cycle. This goes away quickly because after those are metabolized and chewed up and spit out, you will have now less. So it's short-term joint relief due to cortisol. The truth is you could just change your rep range and make the load less and the reps higher, and that should alleviate joint pain. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Fusion Regenerative Therapies, where I am the Director of Human Performance. This is the practice in which I practice medicine. Uh, we'll be able to order you blood work and read your blood work and help you with therapy as needed based upon the results of your blood work. Please click the link to get a consult with me and I can help you optimize your performance. Thank you. It does increase collagen synthesis, but so does EQ. So if you're taking something for collagen synthesis, EQ is probably a better choice. The big difference is, of course, EQ can act as an AI. And as we've established, although nandrolone doesn't upregulate aromatase activity, it upregulates either the amount or the sensitivity of estrogen receptor alpha, which is almost worse because estrogen receptor alpha is the feminizing estrogen receptor. It's not the anabolic receptor like estrogen receptor beta. Estrogen receptor beta is the one that builds muscle, builds bones, protects your liver, and also in some ways upregulates IGF-1 synthesis, even at the muscle tissue. I know a lot of people say that your IGF-1 serum doesn't matter because that's from your liver and we care about the muscle. Everything that happens at the liver also happens at the muscle. And we're using the serum, the, the rate of change or the relative change of the serum level of IGF-1 as a proxy for the relative change of the muscle. If the serum level doubles of IGF-1 when you make a change, then probably the muscular level of IGF-1 changes. And I know a lot of you are like, why does he always bring up this shit? Because in the end, why? how are you growing muscle? You're growing muscle through genomic expression of the testosterone binding to the androgen receptor complex and through IGF-1's activity on the muscle cell. Those are the two ways that in the end, that is always how you're getting muscle synthesis is androgen receptor and IGF-1 receptors. So it, the downstream of an mTOR, you know, like mTOR signaling, AKT signaling, all that stuff. Is it better for training heavy? Well, no, just don't train heavy. Train appropriately for your joints to handle. If it's hurting your joints or hurting your tendons, it's too heavy, back it down and use more reps. I talked about, I know. So DHN. DHN is a weak 
androgen that is basically DECA 5 alpha reduces to DHN, dihydronandrolone, whereas testosterone 5 alpha reduces to DHT, dihydrotestosterone, nandrolone 5 alpha reduces to dihydronandrolone. Unlike DHT, which is strong at non genomic androgen receptor binding, it's, I think it's five times the higher affinity for the androgen receptor, three times the effect. But this is for androgenicity, not for anabolic effect. DHN is weak. So it softens nandrolone's androgenicity to convert to DHN. If you were to use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor to stop nandrolone converting into DHN, it would actually become stronger and ipso facto would actually be more androgenic. In theory, more androgenic than testosterone, although I don't know how that's quite possible. I think that the bottom line is don't mix a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor with nandrolone unless you want to lose your hair. And don't mix nandrolone with testosterone unless you want to get gyno. So if you don't want to get gyno and you don't want to lose your hair, you would have to run nandrolone by itself. But if you run nandrolone by itself, you're not going to create IGF-1 from your GH. So the only population that would really benefit from nandrolone only therapy would be people who won't use GH. My opinion has changed about nandrolone because although I did have good results with nandrolone only, I was running about six to eight units of GH and I was benefiting not at all from it. So it was just a waste of money on GH. If you're going to use GH and you obviously should, it's fantastic. It's using an anabolic without using GH is like running on one leg. You just really wouldn't benefit from using nandrolone in almost any circumstance. And if you did use it, you'd have to use so little of it. I guess there'd be a couple of instances, like you run a tiny, tiny, tiny bit amount of nandrolone, although I see no advantage to that. You could just run anything else. It's stronger at, at an anabolic capacity, but it's only like 10% stronger. So adding 120 or 140 milligrams of nandrolone a week for all the headaches you could run the risk of causing, you're only getting the equivalent of like 150 milligrams of something like testosterone, or you could run a ton of nandrolone, like in the a thousand or something, and then run a tiny amount of testosterone, like 20 or 30 milligrams a day, just to get enough estrogen so that you can get your converting over of GH to IGF-1. But I'm pretty sure what's going to happen is before you maximize the GH to IGF-1 conversion, you're going to get gyno. And I've had gyno surgery now, and it does not mean I can just get away with it. There's still going to be, even if you've had gyno surgery, you're still going to have some breast tissue remaining, which means you can still get gyno a second time. Um, so if you've had problems with DECA or nandrolone, if you've had DECADIC, then if you want help with fixing this, feel free to get a consult. I'm very proficient in correcting the damages that nandrolone has done. Again, you can run nandrolone and it works great by itself, but if you're going to use testosterone or GH, it's better just to use testosterone GH together and not nandrolone. And of course, because of all the side effects you get from DHT and estrogen, you don't want to run a lot of testosterone. Testosterone is a good base, like a foundation. The, the foundation of your house is made out of cement, but your house isn't made out of cement. It's made out of like wood or brick and aluminum siding and drywall. So that's where the other anabolics come in is the testosterone is good for a foundation, but it isn't good to build the whole house out of it. Likewise, nandrolone would be great, but you can't mix it with testosterone. And if you use nandrolone, you're not going to get any benefit out of using GH. I shouldn't say any benefit. You're not going to get an anabolic benefit out of using GH. So if you've got further questions, Feel free to get a consult. The link is in the description box. And until next time, may the force be with you.